Hello, I'm Pedro Mora from the Pacific Coast with Pacific Media, pacific.ca. Ingo Schmidt, a member of the World Peace Forum Society, explains the alternatives we can choose within the spectrum of right and left, capitalism and socialism, and the other ideological axis of sovereignty, like national sovereignty and union, as in the European Union. Here is Zinko. Speaking about alternatives to neoliberal uh, Europe, I thought it would be worth uh, starting um, off by uh, dealing a little bit with the question, is Europe neoliberal in the first place? And uh, if so, how neoliberal is Europe? Because uh, for quite some time it has been fairly popular uh, in uh, social democratic circles, in union circles, uh, particularly more so in this part of the world than in actual Europe, uh, who were discontent uh, with the neoliberal policies uh, at home, it was uh, fairly usual to assume that Europe is somehow fundamentally different, meaning from a perspective of labor, uh, better being a social Europe. And there were academics who would write uh, very informed books about social Europe versus liberal America. Uh, and by implication, Canadians, all, never knowing exactly where they fit in, would think, well, we're probably almost like America, which is too bad, but uh, it would be nice if we could a bit more be a bit more European. Uh, by European, they didn't necessarily mean their interest, ancestry uh, and the uh, former colonial power, even though the current government uh, seems to be keen on getting back uh, to the former colonial uh, power by uh, pooling uh, embassy resources, but that's not my topic. Uh, this is just my nasty, the nasty immigrants comment uh, here. Um, the thing uh, though is that by many standards, uh, Europe is actually much more neoliberal, and I specifically use neoliberal because liberal kind of in the classical sense of liberties uh, could have a positive ring to it and I wouldn't uh, want to denounce it. Neoliberal has no positive rings uh, to anybody who has to sell their labor power and is dependent on uh, wages, uh, unemployment benefits, pensions, uh, occupational health and safety or anything uh, uh, like that. And um, saying that uh, new, uh, Europe is more neoliberal than Canada, than the United States, uh, might come as a surprise, but uh, actually it is true, and you can see that right now in the current crisis. One of the problems uh, you all know about the troubles uh, uh, the Greek economy is supposedly having, and that supposedly having is effectively used to roll back uh, uh, social standards um, uh, of uh, Greek workers, and uh, similarly in Spain, in Italy, in Portugal, uh, in Ireland, more quietly, but uh, same process uh, happening. And one of the differences between uh, Europe uh, and uh, Canada and the United States is you have all these die-hard neoliberal conservative types, uh, particularly in the West, like BC and uh, Alberta, complaining that how they have to feed these lazy uh, new fees and uh, even worse, uh, people in Quebec but uh, let them complain, they have something to complain. And what I'm saying is, there is actually a kind of fiscal transfer going from the relative half provinces to, to the half not provinces. And the same is happening uh, in the United States of America. Can you imagine uh, in the United States, for example, New York, which is home to Wall Street, um, a fairly famous location, uh, economically speaking, um, and uh, totally bankrupted, due to the financial crisis uh, they had uh, that uh, wrecked the state of uh, New York. And a few other states in the United States are also economically in a position uh, similar to uh, Greece. Can you imagine any American left to right saying, well, if they are bankrupt, we have to kick them out? And that's common political debate in parts of Europe vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Greeks. Uh, no American would ever say, oh, then we just kick out New York or Michigan, home to uh, the big three, right, Detroit. Um, so uh, this is kind of just to set the tone that uh, Europe really is neoliberal. Um, and uh, to underscore that point, um, one should be uh, take a closer look at what Europe really is. Um, 
what Europe really is actually is a question uh, that is as difficult uh, to uh, answer as the question what Canadian identity is, so I don't want to go into that at all. When I say Europe, I mean what you can see in terms of institutions like the European Commission, the European Central Bank, etc., etc. Um, and the member states. And the member states of the European Union actually um, do have or achieved at one point uh, social standards considerably higher um, than in most other parts in the world, including Canada and the United States. Um, very differentiated across member states of the EU, kind of the showcase uh, social democracy at uh, its best uh, has been Sweden for a long time. Now social democracy in Sweden has all but disappeared. Uh, the only ones who are hanging on to it uh, are the Norwegians uh, because they have oil money, similar to Canada. They just use it in a different way and they are smart enough never to consider membership in the European Union. Because good social democrats that they are at home, they don't want to share, they are haves, right? They don't want to share that wealth with have-nots in the European Union and compared to Norwegian standard, standards, everybody else uh, in Europe uh, certainly is a have-not uh, and they know it and they don't apply for membership or even though everybody, including uh, Ms. Merkel, would be happy to open the doors for them. And stressing these welfare states that developed within member countries of the EU is important because this is where the myth about social Europe really comes from. Uh, from some countries having achieved a relative uh, high standard of uh, job security and social security that you don't find in too many other places uh, of the world. Um, what is important to understand is that the sole purpose, despite some talk uh, uh, suggesting otherwise by EU officials, the purpose of the European Union right from the start was to create a free trade area um, to kind of contain the claims made by unions and social democratic parties and at some point even conservative parties adopted the social democratic welfare state agenda a uh, long time ago. Uh, to contain claims made by these kind of organized forces of labor. Um, and for a long time that wasn't too successful. It started to change in the 1970s uh, and uh, kind of jumped onto an entirely different scale after the Cold War uh, in the early 90s. And one of the key reasons was uh, membership uh, of uh, Eastern European countries uh, to the EU. Uh, their economic, social and political systems almost completely collapsed and that created a kind of a cheap labor resource area comparable to Mexico's membership in NAFTA. And that had not existed prior to the end of the Cold War because the Soviet Union thankfully protected us from that. So no matter how anti-communist most social democrats were, they greatly benefited from the existence uh, of the Iron Curtain. And that changed when the Iron Curtain uh, fell quite obviously. And uh, since then you got a whole pile of policies uh, creating a new liberal Europe. Um, most famously the European uh, Monetary Union, which in, its, uh, in the treaty that uh, set out the design for that uh, said no political institution whether you vote into office socialist parties, maybe even communist parties or conservative, it doesn't matter because they don't have a say in monetary policies anyways. So that's completely disconnected from political control, so much for democracy in the European Union. Um, it also said the EU is not supposed um, to uh, transfer monies of any um, uh, amount uh, worth mentioning from one country to another. But member countries of the European Union uh, are supposed to stick to certain policy guidelines, not to extend their deficits beyond a certain level. And if they do, um, we will tell them uh, how to rein in their uh, deficits. And this is uh, what we are seeing right now. And this is actually something we have seen before in the 1980s uh, in all over the global south when IMF people walked in when these countries were in debt and told them, oh, you still have a public sector, you have uh, teachers in the public sector, I suggest uh, lay off half of them and cut wages by half for the rest. Uh, just a, one and lots of examples. Uh, and in those days among progressives, uh, it was fairly common to say, yeah, this is imperialism, that's very, that's the rich countries against the poor, which actually 
it's true. Uh, but after wrecking the poor countries uh, and uh, capitalists still uh, profit thirsty, they had to look somewhere else uh, where to apply these policies. In the 90s, they could apply that successfully in the collapsing Soviet empire, where you saw a so-called structural adjustment laying off uh, people in the public sector, uh, driving down wages, uh, any other social standards on a scale uh, going beyond what happened, for example, in uh, Latin America in the 1980s. Uh, well, and now there's not too much left, and now they're coming closer to the center. And uh, moving from Eastern Europe to the center, first stop is Greece. Um, next stop is uh, Portugal, Spain, Italy. And last stop uh, will be uh, Germany, even though German workers at this uh, point are quite contempt and they love Angela Merkel uh, by assuming that she will protect them from uh, what's happening in Greece, assuming that they are so uh, hard-working people that what happened to the Greek people can never happen to them because the Greeks are lazy butts and German workers are hard-working tough guys. Um, uh, which is actually not true. Hours put in by Greek workers uh, uh, are longer than those put in by German workers, but uh, of, obviously having a German accent, I haven't said that, not that you denounce me to the German working class uh, suggesting they work less hard than Greek workers uh, do. Um, and uh, I think I stop um, talking about how neoliberal Europe is uh, at this point and just take it as a matter of fact and um, even uh, uh, a superficial look at the news will suggest uh, that there is huge um, discontent with the kind of Europe that I call neoliberal uh, that we are having these days. So I start uh, moving to the alternatives to neoliberal Europe. Um, what I'm saying here is that one major outcome of the last economic crisis, starting in 2008, 2009, which economically has not gone to the uh, scale it did uh, in the Great Depression of the 1930s, that may still to come, it may not, but what it has done is it destroyed the universal belief that markets fix your problems. Whatever your problem is, there will be a market that fixes that. Uh, until a few years ago, even die-hard Marxists would, would say, I don't like it, but somehow it just works. I hate it, and it still works. Nowadays, only very few people dare saying markets fix everything. Actually, politicians are quite busy kind of trying to distance themselves from that. Um, and trying to find scapegoats of all sorts, like in Germany they find the lazy Greeks. Um, and everywhere they, some still go on and say, um, well, I've, I've seen a government person, the state must be, uh, like in the US you find people thinking that uh, healthcare uh, as uh, introduced by Obama, called Obamacare, is socialist. They denounce that and say, this is our problem. Um, Guess what? Most people do understand that the calamities the U.S. is in economically started before um, Obama was elected. This whole market über alles ideology uh, is uh, pretty much discredited and people look for alternatives. And for a long time, even on the left, uh, you had a sentiment that there is no alternative. You know, famously coined uh, phrase by Margaret Thatcher. And uh, I remember for years, lefties uh, would say, She's wrong, there are alternatives. But they would never say what that is. They would never mention any alternative. They would just say how Maggie Thatcher was wrong and how there are alternatives and then stop uh, or forget mentioning uh, what they are. And now people are looking for them. Now the thing um, with the discredited neoliberal model in Europe is uh, that as discredited as market logic is, uh, in Europe, with this um, exuberance of political structures like the European Central Bank, the Commission, and the European Court of Justice, and uh, even experts find it hard to find their way through the corridors uh, of uh, Brussels, Strasbourg, and uh, Frankfurt, that's where the money guys uh, are sitting. Uh, and what that does is that everybody thinks that markets did screw things up, stumbles inevitably into some uh, political uh, institution or another having uh, an EU label on it. And what that also does is that people are 
discontent with two things, with economics, with the economic situation, but also with the political structure. So much of the blame for current problems in terms of employment, uh, loss of pensions, uh, loss of public services, uh, uh, you name that, name them, lots of the blame goes to European integration. And understandably enough, I, when I say that the European institutions were founded to roll back public, the public sector and the welfare state, then it makes perfect sense uh, to also blame those institutions for doing what they were supposed to do. Um, so you have uh, different two types of crisis. Uh, one is a crisis of legitimacy of the European process of integration. And I have here the level of integration. This would be kind of isolated zero, ground zero, isolated uh, nation states, not having to do uh, anything uh, with each other. And uh, this would be um, some kind of, keep out the uh, socialist for a moment, United States of Europe of whatever kind. That would be kind of highest form of integration. Uh, where member states of the European Union would be kind of reduced to the significance of like provinces in Canada. Um, and there's lots of talk where to go, whether to have more integration or less um, integration. And I plotted down neoliberal Europe as a starting point here. Nation states being down here still have a very significant role to play. And as a matter of fact, uh, the key decisions all come from nation states and not all nation states in the European Union are equal. Some are more equal than others, uh, which uh, is very well known, particularly in the smaller uh, member states of the Union, contributing to the political <coughs> discontent with this whole political structure. Um, and because of this discontent, there is all kinds of debate whether to go back to the golden days of the isolated nation state, whatever golden you might find about that, uh, or moving uh, ahead saying, well, the problems we are having economically these days in the south of Europe could be uh, possibly solved if we had more Europe. That is one axis of political conflict. The other is kind of the one, uh, as a good old uh, socialist I'm more familiar with, this is left and right, right? This is us versus them. Um, and if you ask where neoliberalism sits, uh, they commonly tell you center-right, even sometimes uh, uh, the parties governing this uh, center-right uh, thing uh, would prefer to call themselves center-left. That's the new Blairite social democrats. Uh, about whom you don't find too much uh, social. But there are kind of genuine social democrats around as well. Believe it or not, you can find them. Uh, not many more than diehard uh, socialists and Marxists, but they do exist. And they keep on talking about the social Europe, which uh, for a while was fairly prominent as lip service for EU bureaucrats. They talked about it all the time without ever meaning it and they're kind of uh, honest social democrats who mean what they say when they say it. There are just not very many uh, of them <clears throat> of that kind left. Um, so that would, if we would go to a social Europe, which could possibly mean, the ideas actually are pretty good, uh, I'd say, uh, if I could have a European welfare state rather than the dream of socialist revolution, I would go for it. I'm just not sure whether uh, it's going to happen. Actually, I'm pretty sure that it's not possible. Uh, but the idea basically is, well, with increasing economic integration across borders, you can't have isolated welfare states. A German welfare state, a French welfare state, maybe even a Greek welfare state. You can't have that. What you should have uh, or what you should do is uh, transpose the national welfare states onto a European level. And then you could avoid some of the economic uh, competitions uh, pitting workers from one country against workers from another country. That's kind of the underlying idea. And as I said, sounds uh, fairly good, uh, but obviously not too many people are convinced that it's possible. Otherwise, there probably would be more um, <clears throat> uh, kind of genuine social democrats. Moving further to the left, you have kind of uh, at the extreme end um, 
the United Socialist States of Europe. This is something that Leon Trotsky uh, suggested at uh, one point uh, of his life. And there are socialists who think that's a good idea. It's not entirely clear um, how to get there. Uh, and uh, parts of the groups who are uh, working within, it's a kind of a coalition. Uh, it's not a homogeneous party, but parts of the groups working in, in it, um, they are very pro-Europe, but a very different kind of Europe and kind of making the argument, if you want what the social democrats are suggesting, you have to break the power of capital because capital will always, when there's a crisis, roll back whatever gains workers might have made during times of economic um, prosperity. And those days are obviously gone, as we can see for a lot number of years in a row now. So these people would say, actually, we are more realistic than these utopian social democrats because the economic underpinnings of social democratic welfare states are gone, and those underpinnings were uh, economic prosperity. But obviously there are people, and this is this dotted line, um, and these two words, transformation versus uh, revolution, uh, there are people, particularly those who figure, well, if there's a crisis, how do I keep on making more money, stuffing my pockets? Uh, well, if the economy is growing, I have to uh, get the money out of somebody else's pocket. And if these guys try to stop me from doing so, I will hate it. I will do everything I can to stop them from doing so. And then the question is whether these guys are strong enough to launch a full-scale revolution or not. Um, and if not, then this might not happen, and we might have uh, to look at the other side of the, this uh, diagram with alternatives. But not before um, I will mention uh, these guys. You see, if you start from here, you can move to the left and to the right, but you can also change the level of European integration. You can have more Europe, like these guys suggest, uh, but you can also have significantly less, and that's also prominent in Greek policies um, these days, even though they took quite a hit uh, in the last election. That's the Communist Party of Greece. Uh, that's still a kind of Moscow-oriented uh, Communist Party that gets actually elected. <clears throat> in the last election, they uh, got 5%, uh, which in Canada or the United States would be probably a reason for a military coup. Uh, in, in Greece, it was actually down from um, something between 7 and 8%. Uh, percent. And most people who moved politically to the left actually uh, were more pro-European than the Greek Communist Party. The political power of the European Parliament is uh, similar to the National uh, Congress uh, of China, uh, which is not known to be a a port of uh, people's power, even though it's the People's Republic, uh, supposedly, of China. Uh, what I'm saying is that the European Union uh, is an entirely technocratic, undemocratic um, uh, structure. And there are some people who say, well, if we wouldn't have to involve parliaments all the time, slowing down the economic restructuring, restructuring process, making the crisis worse, then everything would be fine. And that would be the uh, dictatorship of the Troika. It's kind of the right-wing version of uh, dictatorships of the proletariat, where, where a few um, self-appointed vanguard enlightened uh, Marxists would lead the workers into paradise, and the workers would think, well, it's time to get rid of those guys. Um, these are kind of the pinstripe uh, talking uh, economic theory and number crunching all the time, uh, telling people what's good for them and what's bad. Totally anti-democratic, uh, but this is in the... Uh, and some um, of the measures uh, taken to contain the crisis in Greece actually are moving into that uh, direction. If that would kind of um, go all the way, it would be a counter-revolution because it would mean to uh, suspend uh, the national parliaments that still can have some countervailing power. And one of the difficult issues here is, even if you're a lefty pro-European, like these guys are, um, you are faced with the problem um, that at this point, national governments, more down here, have more 
uh, of a democratic uh, basis than anything existing on the European level. That's the case. Uh, so moving to this would require a counter-revolution, kind of uh, just telling national parliaments, well, you can keep on sitting there, but we won't listen to you. You can even pass laws, but we won't even read them. You might as well go home. Uh, Troika refers to three things in this case. Uh, it's the European Central Bank, the European Commission, and the International Monetary Fund. Um, but what's behind them are the strong governments um, um, in Europe, and the strongest one within Europe, at least, uh, certainly is uh, the German one, and that brings the idea of German hegemony back into. And uh, if you walk down the streets uh, of Greece, uh, you will find these uh, graffitis saying, they are back. And guess what they, whom they mean by they? They mean the Germans, who in the past were stupid enough to send their tanks, and now are smart enough to send the European Central Bank. The whole purpose of giving you this full spectrum is uh, to say first, yes, there are alternatives. Secondly, this must not be a good thing. Uh, thirdly, everything is possible, but uh, nothing is certain at this uh, point in time. I think a key lesson is don't get too excited when you see a big demo anywhere in Europe. Yes, there are big demos uh, in Europe and it's all great, but um, the economic power sits not where people are protesting. The economic power sits in Frankfurt, Berlin, London, Paris. Um, only if you see back big demos there saying Greek workers are our brothers and sisters, you see progress. And there's quiet on that northern front, so to speak. Uh, meaning that workers in the um, creditor countries um, have the sense, if I don't move, maybe the bosses forget to slash my wages, to cut my job. Just don't be visible. Um, and the Greek workers, obviously, they're in the spotlight, so they have nowhere else to go but take to the streets, and they do, and that's great, and they have to do that. Ingo Smith explained the political and economic alternatives we have within the axis of socialism and capitalism, as well as the axis of national sovereignty and centralized unions, or empires, if you will. Our political position on Ingo's chart needs to be literally defined and written down on our own constitution. This constitution needs to be independent from monarchy, political parties, and even independent from political representatives or political leaders. It needs to be developed by us, all the citizens. A framework of this perpetual direct democracy is published by Amazon.com on this little booklet, Perpetual Direct Democracy. And you can also read it online for free on our website, pacific.ca. I am Pedro Mora.